Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, first talker, Dr. Sasa Kristovic. She has been done uh, great uh, contributions uh, in, in the field of uh, uh, recognition of uh, non-speed uh, sounds uh, in the context of uh, smart fit, uh, cities. And uh, the title of, of his talk is uh, Sound is not speech. So I think this is somehow related to this, this uh, work. Welcome. Thank you, Thomas. Um, um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sasha Kostrovic. I'm the director of A-Labs, which is the research division of a company called Audio Analytic. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah? OK. So the title of the talk is Sound is Not Speech. Uh, so speech is sound, sound is not speech. There is a bit of suspense and drama in there. Uh, I'm going to uh, explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, but to introduce this talk, um, most of you have probably seen um, Google's announcements of their uh, new range of Made by Google products. Uh, this uh, lineup of products is a good illustration of what's happening in the bigger picture of smart home products or smart personal products. You can see smart speakers, you can see a laptop, mobile phone, you can see a live logging camera, you can see a whole range of products, some of them for the home, uh, doorbell, uh, surveillance cameras and so on. Uh, and that's paramount across uh, all, all brands. You have Google in that sphere, you have Amazon, you have Apple, uh, all, the, all the big companies. Uh, and you have a whole galaxy of uh, other brands uh, producing that, that kind of thing. Now, the interesting thing about uh, the talk, uh, the Google's talk, was that um, the, the uh, line, the, the storyline about all these products was about artificial intelligence. And the, the, the common point, the common denominator of all these products uh, was artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence, you have several types of problems that uh, artificial intelligence is tackling. You have speech recognition, so speech-oriented uh, uh, artificial intelligence, speech recognition, speech synthesis, uh, biometric voice recognition, <coughs> sorry, for identity personalization. You have machine translation. Then you have image-oriented uh, uh, AI, which is doing face recognition, video processing, and so on. Then you have another type of uh, audio AI, which is music. Uh, so fingerprinting, for example, recognizing tracks, query by humming, and so on. Now, uh, in my opinion, there was one uh, missing piece to that puzzle, which is sound recognition AI, sound in a wider sense than speech and music. Um, enter audio analytic. For the first time, devices can intelligently re respond to sound. Uh, what our company produces is algorithms and software for sound recognition. We were founded in 2010. Uh, we're based in Cambridge uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, and we have offices also in Palo Alto uh, in the USA. We have about uh, over 40 people right now, uh, most of them being experts in machine listening, sound recognition, software engineering, and so on. And we're a venture-backed company. So we've been uh, uh, honored that Bloomberg qualified as an AI startup like no other, like a Shazam for real world sounds, which is a, a simple way of explaining what is it that we're doing. Uh, our active market focus is uh, smart speakers and smart home devices. Uh, the value uh, that we add to these devices is support for well-being of the family, loved ones, and so on. Uh, we have products such as uh, glass break detection, smoke alarm uh, detection, baby cry, a whole range of uh, sound event detection products. But we also have expanding market focus in a, in a whole uh, bunch of areas. Um, and, and the vision is that uh, all technology will become context aware through sound detection um, in the near future. Now, uh, that was the kind of marketing side introduction of the, of the company. But I would like to, to, what I would like to talk, to talk about today is sound is not speech, as in what are the research challenges that sound recognition are, are, is facing, which are distinct, which make it a distinctive problem from speech detection or, or music processing. And there's a bunch of them. So first question is, uh, is there a language of sound? Uh, speech uh, is bounded by language. If I, uh, so we, can, we could, for example, count uh, the uh, number of words in the, in the English language. This is about 170,000 words with a few obsolete ones, derivative, and so on. It's all countable. You can make new words, but it's going to be a small amount compared to the ones which are established uh, uh, words in the language. Uh, one uh, manifestation of that is that uh, old school, when you wanted to make a language model, you take the Wall Street Journal. Um, and then uh, you count the co-occurrences of words, and then and there you have your language model. 
Uh, you might want to specialize it to dialogue systems and so on, but you can do that with, uh, with simple uh, text corpus. And if I ask you to, to complete a sentence, if I say hello, hello, hello world. Most of you being computer programmers, you go hello world. Could have been hello Sasha, could have been hello Jonathan, could have been hello mom, I'm talking at the same workshop. Uh, but we can pretty much uh, guess uh, a number of um, uh, um, legit endings to that sentence. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that, uh, for example, modern end-to-end -end speech recognition is exploiting by predicting directly the sequence of labels from the uh, acoustic sequence. Uh, things like the CTC networks uh, are aiming at, at uh, modeling that kind of direct probability uh, density um, between the labels and the audio. But is the, is this, can, can the same thing be done for speech? So if I ask you now, what sound will I make now? Any idea, anyone? Did you even know that you could do that with your mouth? Anyway, it could have been anything, could have been that, could have been this, could have been whatever else. Uh, and very little in the room, almost nothing in the room. You could argue, yes, but you have a mouth, you have a finger, therefore you can do that kind of sound. But uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's much harder, uh, as you've seen now, to, to predict what sounds occur in a scene than, um, in, uh, than predicting the series of words in language. So that's one of the problems. Um, that, that, that sound recognition is facing. Uh, <coughs> nonetheless, sounds uh, are still communicative. Although there is no uh, formal uh, language uh, in, the, in the linguistic sense, uh, sounds are informative. And they are, um, a long time ago, I was looking to define classes uh, of sounds uh, in order to see which ones uh, are uh, more useful than others. And so I came up with a, with a sort of taxonomy, which was the sounds which are uh, crafted to communicate something, so intentionally communicative. Uh, smoke alarms, your microwave beep or something, the car horns are designed to communicate something. Uh, you have uh, incidental cues, which are sounds which are indicative of some precise event happening, which you might want to be uh, informed about. So glass break uh, informs you that somebody's uh, breaking in. Uh, vacuum cleaner might be informing you that uh, somebody's there cleaning the room and so on. And then there are the more diffuse, more environmental sounds, uh, which might not be directly related to human action. So aircon is arguable because someone might have switched on the aircon. But if it's an automated process of the building, for example, uh, you might have aircon noise in the room, which is just there. Um, and it's not necessarily related to uh, somebody doing something. Bubble noise of the same nature, wind, rain. And in the uh, League of Environmental Sounds, some of them you might want to know about. You might want to wonder if you switched off your aircon before leaving or something like that. Um, uh, but uh, some of them also are just noise. If you walk in the streets of New York, uh, you very often, you, uh, very, very soon, you forget about the traffic noise, but it's still there. And the notion of generative model for sounds somewhat remains valid. So. Um, Probability of smoke alarm given the sound of beep is something that you can uh, calculate. However, there is one uh, big difference, which is, uh, is you're going to try to calculate the probability of smoke alarm given beep and a lots of other things which might be happening in the scene and which might not be informative at all about the smoke alarm. I'll come back to that in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, one thing which is another difference is the variety of production processes. So for speech, you have a resonance process, you have the vocal cords which are uh, exciting the vocal tract. Vocal tract is shaping the, the phon phonetic sounds. Uh, it's the similar thing for music instruments. If you take the saxophone, it's like a different type of vocal tract. You have the reed uh, exciting the tube and the tube is shaping the sounds. And it's going to be the same thing for most musical instruments. They, most of them are, are, are uh, uh, exploiting the resonance phenomena. Now if you do something like this, this is a glass break. This is. Um, us breaking glass actually in our um, in our um, test facility uh, in Cambridge, uh, we've broken hundreds of windows to actually uh, study the sound of glass breaking, uh, and and the real sound of glass breaking. Uh, that's that's very much more real than uh, taking sounds out of uh, free sound or whatever online database. We did break windows with all sorts of glass uh, thicknesses, glass materials, size of windows, and so on to be really sure what uh, what this phenomenon was about. And so, uh, in nature, that's very different from resonance phenomena. It's a hard object hitting another hard, hard surface. That hard surface is going to shatter. It's going to produce a kind of big, uh, uh, it's not a shock wave, but it's a, it's a wave which is very, very sharp. Uh, and then you're going to have the aftermath of breaking the glass, which is all the little glass pieces falling on the floor. And each of them is going to have uh, different sizes and so on. And that's going to uh, produce a very, uh, very random, very specific sound, which has nothing to do with the resonance phenomenon. 
So if we explore the diversity of acoustic, uh, acoustic features, acoustic uh, the nature of different acoustic phenomena, um, we have beep sounds. So that's a smoke alarm. Uh, that's, those, that's a series of very simple tones with silence in between. Then um, that's, the, that's one of our glass breaks. You can see very sharp sound with some aftermath. Violin is a, is a harmonic phenomenon, but with very uh, flat behavior in time. Baby cry is a mix of harmonic phenomena with some kind of uh, variation uh, in, in, of frequency in time. But you also have uh, what's called the vocal fry in the middle, which is where the vocal effort of the baby puts the vocal falls into a, some kind of noisy kind of mode. And this simply is a vacuum cleaner, which is a shaped uh, noise, white noise. With, and this one happens to have a hiss in the middle, which is a pure tone. So here you can see the diversity of acoustic phenomena we're dealing with. It's not just one phenomenon which would be uh, resonance with formants and stuff, just like speech. Uh, that's a very wide, wide variety of uh, acoustic uh, production processes, which lead to um, uh, different types of features. Now, one of the questions is, should the acoustic features be handcrafted or learned? So this is our baby from before. Now if I play that sound. Can you guess what that sound is? Anybody? What is it? Yeah, it's filters. Very high. Filters. Yeah, it's filters. So the spectrogram of that sound is this. <laughs> So we took the, the image, and then we, um, we reverted it to, to, to playing sounds. That's a demo we did for the Science Festival in Cambridge, where we were asking kids. Uh, we had a touch screen, and we were asking them to draw the harmonics and so on. And very, very fast, what happened was this. They were drawing uh, pictures or writing their names on the screen and, uh, and, and listening to, oh, yeah, that's the sound of my name. <laughs> right. So, in so far as, um, as most standard acoustic features were invented by looking at spectrogram images, um, uh, if image recognition can infer features, uh, then why not? So we've, sometimes we hear criticism, oh, conv convnets are image technique. Uh, why do we use that for audio or other? I, I don't have a problem with that because actually uh, there is such a kind of correspondence between uh, 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 what we see on the spectrogram and, the, and what we can imagine to be the uh, acoustic features that, you know, why not? Why not? Uh, so another question is, are acoustic features enough? If you take the Our Baby Cry, or if you take this, which is an angry woman, uh, you have um, Several, you, you have the, uh, the uh, harmonics are still there, so that's a common between them. The uh, f uh, pitch, the, the fundamental frequency is roughly in the same ballpark. Uh, so the acoustic features themselves might not be uh, enough to uh, distinguish between uh, these two sounds. But if you look at the um, temporal evolution of one and the other, uh, you might uh, realize that the uh, temporal patterns of baby cry uh, versus uh, female voices uh, are very different. So there is a thing about the baby, uh, baby's lung capacity, for example, where they have to catch their breath between two episodes of crying. Uh, and that can lead to that kind of uh, pattern interrupted with breathing. Um, and so uh, each and every sound is going to have uh, its own temporal pattern, which is, again, related to the, to the production process uh, uh, at, uh, at the beginning of it. So temporal modeling might help. So as a matter of fact, if you look at the top systems, uh, if we look at the task two of the DK's data challenge, so the DK's challenge is a comparative evaluation between uh, sound recognition systems across four different tasks. And task two was the, the one uh, which was uh, detection of rare events. Uh, and the, those rare events this year were baby cry, glass break, gunshots, uh, overlaid on, uh, on a variety of background, background noises street, park, and so on. Uh, so looking at the, the results of that, the top two systems, and many of the systems which were presented were actually uh, uh, blending two type, well, several types of neural, neural network approaches. Uh, so uh, the two top systems um, were uh, starting with, um, where's my laser? Oh, OK, not 
Ah, yeah. Okay, we're starting with uh, we're starting from uh, the MEL spectrogram, which is a kind of raw, kind of not not a lot of processing applied to the uh, to the waveform. Is just uh, extracting the, uh, the the frequencies uh, across the male, uh, male frequencies, uh, which are uh, related to the properties of, of hearing, and then they were applying some uh, layers of uh, convolut convolutive uh, neural networks, uh, assumed to perform some form of feature extraction. Uh, I will come back to why I'm saying uh, assuming. Uh, then uh, both of the systems had uh, a layer of um, uh, um, recursive neural networks uh, with uh, LSTM units or GRU uh, generalized uh, recurrent units. Uh, again, assuming that uh, this is uh, producing uh, temporal modeling, which is really interesting. Uh, and then uh, some simpler layer uh, feed forward layers with sigmoid functions to, uh, to produce a decision at the end of the system of where the sound is in the recording. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, we, we, we started seeing a pattern there of systems which have these layers of uh, feature extraction, uh, temporal modeling, uh, and then decision at the end. Uh, one of the things is like the, the DK's challenge in 2016 was presenting a, a, a wider variety of systems. Uh, there were still a few of the quote, quote, uh, dinosaurs like the, the GMMs and support vector machines and so on. Uh, but actually, are these models really dead or is it that they get less of the spotlight actually uh, nowadays? That's, that's a, uh, a relevant question. So this year, we haven't seen that many alternatives to the CRNN approach, which um, I don't know, we, we, we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, but uh, you know, I believe in diversity and variety. So uh, th those systems are really, really interesting, but I think it, they should not kill uh, other approaches. Um, uh, so another thing which is very specific to sound modeling is the notion of interrupted sequences. If we look at our smoke alarm again, it's, uh, that pattern is called the T3 pattern. It's, um, it's uh, standardized. And uh, the, the standard for the T3 pattern is uh, half a second of beep, then half a second of silence uh, three times, and then another half second when you want to uh, separate your two series of three beeps. But actually, it's not really silence. Those 0.05 seconds could be anything. Uh, if your smoke alarm is uh, happening when you're cooking, for example, you have all sorts of cooking noises in the silence. Uh, or if you have an air con at your home, you're going to have a different uh, background noise than if you're in a silent room like this one. So out of the four second sequence of the smoke alarm, 62%, two thirds of the sounds do, does not predict anything about the sound itself. Whereas in speech, the contribution of silence, the pauses are fairly short. Um, or in music, uh, same story, the, the, the pauses are fairly short. Um, so there is, uh, perhaps we need some kind of attention mechanism, modeling of the attention mechanism. Uh, this is a system which was presented in DK's 2016 uh, by uh, Mark Plumley's team. Uh, and uh, this, the, the interesting thing about this, uh, this was a neural network based. So uh, we had the, the usual uh, pattern of uh, convolutive network with a recursion for temporal modeling and then the feed forward neural networks for decision. But there, was, there were two extra branches. One was uh, attention network, attention mechanism modeled by uh, a, a simple network with the sigmoid activations. And then another one was a, a softmax layer for location, localization of the sound in the recording. But I, I, I thought this one, uh, this, the, the presence of this uh, attention mechanism was really, really interesting. And uh, that's uh, probably uh, something we need for the modeling of uh, interrupted sequences. Uh, I think uh, this year's um, uh, system uh, presented by the same team also, uh, which, which ranked first at the um, weekly supervised uh, sound recognition task, the task four, uh, also included a uh, attention mechanism. And that's, that's an interesting thing to, to notice. Um, so another thing, uh, if you look at 24-7 sound recognition, if you have a, a device, uh, a camera or something, or a home assistant listening to what's happening in the uh, environment 24-7, um, then the occurrence of the target sound, say baby cry or say smoke alarm, is much, much rarer, more rare than the occurrence of non-target sounds. So you have one sound which is up against a whole variety of sounds. If you live in a house with a family, you're going to have children making lots of different sounds. Um, if you have um, uh, senior citizens, they might be listening to the TV louder than other people and so on. You have a whole bunch of things uh, which can happen, uh, either generated by the house itself or um, 
uh, outside of a home. So if you live close to near an airport, you might have aircraft noises. Or if you're uh, in, a, in, a, in a developing city, you might have uh, construction <coughs> building happening. Uh, so that gives you kind of like a visual uh, hint that the uh, target sound, the, the non-target uh, sounds actually, is a much, much bigger set than the target sounds. And the confusion matrix for that kind of problem would be one sound against an infinity of them. Uh, so as I said, the variability of the non-target set is very large. Uh, and that, for neural networks, poses problems of data balance. Uh, the non-target set being much larger than the target set, if you don't uh, uh, design some strategy for data balancing, uh, you're going to have a network which is completely overwhelmed by the non-target uh, information. Uh, so, so there are things there which are really interesting to, to, to solve in terms of uh, data balancing problems. Now, uh, you could also think of a completely different approach, which is uh, uh, recasting the problem as an open set recognition problem. And uh, open set recognition proposes to model a ball around the target data and some measure of uh, outlierism. So, uh, but it's very early days for, for that kind of techniques. Uh, we've seen early results in vision and forensics. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, tutorial uh, by uh, Rosha and Scherer in uh, ICIP 2016 which is just simply an open set recognition problem. Um, most of the models which are uh, producing open set recognition are using support vector machines at the moment because uh, you can use the distance from the margin as, as that me measure of uh, outlierism. But um, 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 we've seen also like neural networks with uh, um, open set last layer, but that was more for multi-class problems, not for single class problems. So there is something there which is early days, but very, very interesting to think about. So uh, back to all these uh, neural network architectures, research is evolving and we're seeing very clearly, uh, I'm back from WASPA, so uh, conferences like WASPA, but in, in general in, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence and signal processing research for, for audio in particular, uh, a paradigm shift. So uh, from, from the explicit modeling of phenomena, so MFCCs are capturing some of the pro uh, properties of the ear and their uh, 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 spectrum, um, spectrum shape model. Uh, or generative models like Markov chains, like speech, or old school speech was the series of states and so on, which are which is mirroring the, the succession, the sequence of phones. Um, uh, factorization and sparsity. So factorization was uh, uh, looking at uh, extracting units, so just uh, like musical notes. So units which are grounded in some kind of uh, 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 how to say object, uh, acoustic object. Um, there was an uh, intermediate stage which was heavily data-driven DNN models, so bottleneck features, for example, was kind of saying, okay, now let's just uh, assume that the, that the neural network is going to capture uh, features, but it was still a feature extractor, like explicitly a feature extractor. Or computing posteriors for feedforward DNNs, um, so, so you were replacing the, your Gaussian models by uh, something else, in that case, the, the feedforward DNNs. And nowadays, uh, uh, clearly, uh, there is something really interesting happening is that DNNs are, uh, are uh, being mixed up and assembled uh, by function. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's assumed that the convolutive neural nets, well, convolutive neural nets are being used with the hope that they're doing feature extraction. Temporal uh, recursive uh, neural networks uh, are there for the function of modeling some temporal evolution. Um, Attention networks are there for the function of focusing certain types of modeling. Uh, CTC networks in speech are for the function of dealing with the uh, uh, label sequences. So now neural networks are not just a one single animal. They're starting to uh, become a, a Lego set where you can have several functions achieved by several architectures. Um, but the, this thing is, to the, to, for the moment, largely evaluation driven. Uh, uh, and, and very often you read in uh, publications or you hear people saying, assuming that the network architecture does a X, uh, evaluation shows that improves the race by Y percent. Uh, but for the moment, the certainty or, or the insight into uh, the type of features that uh, CNNs are extracting and so on is, is very early days. Uh, so we've seen work, for example, in Thomas Team for visualizing uh, the type of uh, features or, uh, that, that CNNs are extracting or the uh, type of uh, things that uh, RNNs are doing. Uh, so we're getting there. Uh, but it's not the same nature. It's not the same type of, 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 uh, of approach than what was coming earlier with uh, explicit models of the year and this and that. So because this is all evaluation driven, data is a parameter, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, probably a good thing. I mean, this is data driven, clearly. Uh, but we have to be extremely careful. 
uh, when I say data is a parameter, what I mean is, uh, OK, when we manipulate neural networks, we can manipulate the uh, number of neurons, the number of layers, and so on. But also manipulating the data is a way to get the network to do something. Uh, data augmentation, for example, is a, is a, is a, is a way of uh, using the data to uh, to craft to uh, the, the manipulation of data has an impact on the capacity uh, capability of the network to achieve this and that. Um, so that's something interesting. Data is not just there to learn. Data is also there to tune the system. You can put more data, less data, and so on. This is really interesting. Um, so as I said before, there are some attempts at interpretation, plotting what the net neural networks are doing. There is some uh, grounding into, well, those networks were designed to solve problem X, Y, Z. Uh, but this could all be a massive horse. Uh, so we have to be extremely careful. When I say a horse, I refer to a work by, uh, by a researcher uh, called Bob Sturm, who used the, the image of uh, the, the metaphor of Hans the horse uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, some music recognition tasks. Uh, Hans the horse is a horse in the, I think it was around the 50s. You can find the whole story on Wikipedia. Hans the horse was thought of to, as uh, being able to do mathematics, perform mathematics. You would say, you ask the horse how much is two plus two. Horse would tap the hoof four times, and people were like, wow, this horse can do additions, multiplications, whatever. And there is one uh, scientist, uh, Dr. Fuchs, I think, or something like that, uh, the guy with the lab coat on this, uh, on this picture, um, who, was, uh, who started studying why, why, uh, what's happening there. Well, is that horse really doing mathematics? And what he discovered with various experiments was that the horse was actually latching on people's reactions to uh, the horse tapping the hoof. Uh, which is something different than actually doing mathematics. So it was a simulacra. It was that giving people the, uh, the, the feeling that it was doing mathematics, but actually what it was latching on was something completely different. And it's not uh, impossible that, uh, that uh, the machine, modern machine learning uh, is doing that on some of these data tasks. So we have to be really, really careful about using a diversity of data sets when we evaluate a system. Um, and, and researchers are very much aware of that. Uh, uh, so, so we're going in the right direction again. But we have to be really careful that the system does not do something else uh, than what we think it's doing. In the case of music uh, recognition, the controversy was about a genre recognition task where it was proven that the network, neural networks were actually doing um, tempo, tempo recognition. And if you were shifting the tempo enough enough to, to, to throw off the, the results, but not enough to change the nature of the genre. Uh, that actually, that was proving that the networks were not doing the genre recognition, were doing temporal recognition, which is a different task. So we need to be extremely careful about these things. Uh, just, I'm just going to talk about two more things which are uh, of interest for sound recognition in the quote, quote, real world. So being, uh, being from uh, uh, the industrial, uh, I mean, a company doing products and so on, we need to be careful about a number of other things. Uh, channel variability is one of the challenges of sound recognition. I'm going to play uh, nine different uh, instances of the same sound recorded through nine different uh, consumer, uh, consumer products. Yeah, so, well, two years, I guess. Um, yeah, so, well, two years, I guess. Um, yeah, so, well, two years, I guess. Um, So you can really uh, uh, practically hear the difference between between all these devices. Some of them were uh, removing the low frequencies. Some of them were uh, boosting the low frequencies. You had muffled sound. You have clearer, less clear, and so on. The three last ones had uh, different types of noises uh, happening. One of them was clipping the sound. The other one was uh, adding white noise on top. Uh, another one was adding a, a, a tone of uh, electromagnetic uh, interference. And so those are the things we have to deal with in the real world. Um, uh, channel, channel robustness in general is, is a very uh, important uh, thing to solve when you're doing uh, uh, sound recognition products. Another thing is about running on the edge. Uh, so uh, speech uh, may use cloud computing. What about sound recognition for consumer products? So running on the edge still has lots of value for that kind of products. Um, first of all, it's a very simple form of distributed computing. You have uh, billions of uh, these devices uh, in the field. 
And so that's like a massive, uh, I mean, instead of buying the infrastructure yourself, you ask your customers to, to buy the little computer which is going to achieve the function of recognizing sound. Uh, that's a very good way to uh, to go uh, to 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 uh, get rid of the privacy concerns because the sound recognition being done on board the device, then the sound does not leave people's homes, so there is no question about who whoever else is uh, uh, listening to it. It's happening on board the device only. Uh, reliability, is a thing, uh, reliability is a thing because if uh, you remove the uh, need for internet connectivity, then you remove one possible point of failure. Um, and then real-time operation, you don't need to wait for the answer from your server uh, for sound recognition. You have it directly from your, your algorithm. So those things have value. Uh, but then if you want to run an embedded system, uh, you have to optimize the computational cost. Uh, uh, and so one of the studies, so uh, this is something we published uh, uh, qu quite a number of years ago, so it was still like old school systems, GMMs, uh, SVNs, uh, and then simple um, uh, feed-forward DNNs or uh, recursive neural networks. That's just, uh, the point here is more about the methodology, uh, as in uh, the uh, sound recognition uh, Accuracy comes at a certain uh, computational cost, and in this diagram we plotted the uh, equal error rate, so some measure of uh, sound recognition performance, uh, against the number of operations that each of the uh, tested machines involved. Uh, and we saw uh, at the time that the um, GMMs were doing a, a decent job at classifying sounds at a fairly low uh, computational cost. Um, support vector machines were all over the shop. And then uh, uh, neural networks, so the fit world ones, uh, were, doing, uh, were having the best compromise between uh, recognition performance and uh, a number of operations, which was a simple measure of uh, computational cost. So it's important to do that kind of thing uh, for, for uh, running on embedded devices. Right, so as a summary, uh, uh, I hope I made the point that sound is not speech, as in it's a different, classes of, uh, different class of problems that, that we have to solve to perform sound recognition. Um, so sound is not bounded by language or by musical theory. It can be anything. It's got that sheer variety of uh, acoustic production processes and phenomena. Um, so yes, uh, just say the diversity of production process acoustic features. Then uh, temporal structure matters, uh, but it involves interruption. Uh, there is lots of things in the in the signal that we're processing where that is not a good predictor of the signal uh, that that we're actually uh, trying to detect. And uh, also that problem of one against many. You have one sign that you want to recognize, and that's up against anything that can happen in a, in a smart home. Uh, this is very important to keep in mind. And that generates, that triggers uh, uh, interest for uh, data balancing and that kind of thing. Uh, additional topics which might be similar to speech but are of interest for industry impact are uh, robustness to channel and room response. That's very, very important because uh, all these consumer devices were not necessarily as geared toward good audio quality as mobile phones, for example. And running on the edge matters uh, for several reasons. Uh, therefore, computational cost is a tangible question. Uh, whatever algorithm we're going to deploy, we have to find ways of making it work uh, in, in, uh, in these devices. Um, now, because it's a new type of AI in, in its own right, with, with its own set of problems, uh, there is also an interesting thing, which is that uh, a new research community is forming around it. One of the uh, manifestations of that is the book that uh, we just uh, uh, came out. Uh, it's uh, edited by Thomas Virtan and Mark Plumley and uh, Dan Ellis from, from Google. Uh, Thomas Virtanen from uh, Technical University of uh, Technology of Finland, Mark Plumley from University of Surrey, Google, and Dan is from Google. And uh, that gathered a series of uh, authors. I've been very uh, honored to, to contribute one of the chapters to, to this book. Uh, and this would be, uh, I mean, at the, today in 2017, the textbook about sound recognition. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you're interested in that kind of topic, to, to have a look at this. This is going to give you a very good uh, idea, a panorama of all the things that are happening uh, today uh, in, in the world of, of sound, uh, sound recognition. Um, I, I hope you found that interesting. If you, uh, just plugging, if you are uh, interested in that kind, if you want to work on these kind of problems, please uh, join us at Audio Analytic. We are hiring at the moment. We'd be happy to, to work with, uh, with many of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sasha, for a very inspiring speech. Uh, so I'm pretty sure there is lots of uh, questions. Uh, you, mentioned, uh, 
You mentioned anomaly detection early on about one of the. So mm -hmm. do, are you actually addressing that? Is, can you say something a bit about how your approach, because it's kind of a, a difficult task in general. I'm curious about how you're approaching it. Yes. Um, so, well, it is, it is a difficult task. There is also a kind of controversy between definition of anomaly versus the definition of uh, activity. Um, I think it's very difficult to, 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 uh, to define what is an anomaly. Um, I, I can't. I mean, I'm not allowed to tell you the, the detail of, of what we're doing, obviously, because uh, that's that's our intellectual property, and we're a bit kind of protective of it. Um, but um, but essentially, um, um, yeah, anomaly detection. Uh, you need to have some form of uh, adaptiveness of the system to your background, and you need to have a measure of uh, of what's what's out of the um, out of the of the norm that the system would adapt to. So you can imagine all the fun problems on uh, defining the temporal uh, horizon of uh, um, where you want to, to define the anomaly. Um, but, you know, customers seem to be happy with our product, so there we go. This is not so much a question, but just to say, if anyone's interested in the book, then Thomas and myself will have a copy of it floating around today uh, over the poster session. So actually, I would like to ask, uh, one of the challenges in this uh, field that I find is that, uh, like in speech, uh, if you compare speech and environmental sound, in speech, you, you have really uh, clear uh, or much more clear uh, taxonomy. So uh, speech consists of, of phonemes and, uh, and yeah. words and, and so on. But in, uh, if you consider environmental sounds, it's much more cl uh, unclear what should be actually the labels that uh, an, an, uh, an environmental sound uh, can have very different meaning for different uh, listeners. So, so of course, in, in, in a company uh, working on specific products, uh, you, I mean, that might be rather clear how to define those. But do you see any general uh, mm. approaches to this? Yeah, so, well, Insofar, uh, it's funny, at Waspa there was a poster about uh, recognizing how uh, people would uh, imitate certain sound like psh, bang, uh, whoa, uh, th that kind of thing. So uh, at Audionetic we have the, the notion of uh, ideophones, which is uh, 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 sounds which are, you could think of them as phonetic units for, uh, for sound recognition. Uh, and those phonetic units, again, are, are related to a taxonomy of various sounds. I mean, we have uh, studies covering thousands of, of, of homes of what type of sounds are happening uh, in them. It's a very large uh, uh, number of sounds. You, you can't necessarily, uh, how to say, um, uh, uh, count all of them, but you can establish a kind of taxonomy of which ones are produced by humans, which ones are, or which ones are related to this and that uh, production phenomenon, resonance versus uh, noise versus this and that. Um, uh, one of the approaches uh, for labeling uh, is one that you guys c came up with, actually, which was really good, which is uh, always uh, including in the label the, the object and the action, as in, uh, uh, I don't know, woman singing, woman shouting, uh, uh, coffee grinder grinding, uh, vacuum cleaner humming, buzzing or something. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that was a, a really good way of, of defining the, this kind of uh, taxonomy and having some notion of labeling which, uh, which holds. Uh, one of the things, I mean, uh, we're all having the same problems in terms of sometimes it's difficult to find the, the end of the sound for some of the sounds which are continuous. For, uh, that's very true for um, environmental sounds, like when does the car finish passing? Uh, for home home sounds, smart home sounds is a bit less the case. Many of the sounds are sort of discrete, have a f fairly easy to define beginning and end. So maybe it's less of a problem for indoor sounds than outdoor sounds, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, thank uh, Sasha again. Thanks.